Hi, my name is Peter Michael Bauer, and I'm standing here today on Kalapuya and Chinookan territory, as well as many other tribes that use this area. Um, I am the director of Rewild Portland, and I'm also the Bone Tools Guy at Oregon Country Fair, which is why I am making this video. Sadly, because of COVID-19, the fair is not happening this year, and so I'm just going to make this video to kind of talk about my Bone Tool collection and uh, educate you a little bit on um, what bone tools are. So I'm going to be a little bit rusty. Normally at Country Fair, I'm doing this spiel all day long, three days in a row. So I kind of ease into it as people walk into the park. Uh, I have not had that opportunity to, um, you know, brush up and, and sort of dust off this lecture over the last year. So it's going to be a little bit rusty. Bear with me. Um, bone tools are one of my favorite uh, pieces of ancestral technology. Um, one of the things that we like to talk about is, uh, some people use the term primitive technology. Um, archaeologists started using that term in the 70s, uh, probably before that, just to mean first technologies. Uh, however, due to the pejorative aspect of the word primitive, a lot of us have moved away from that and now use the word ancestral skills. Um, and so, an ancestral technology. So this technology is one of the very first forms of human technology. Um, and before I get into that, I like to talk about what a tool is. So when we think about a tool, it's essentially an extension of ourselves that is non-biological. So in early evolution of humans, in order to access animal proteins locked inside of bones, instead of developing fangs or claws, we developed a tool, an extension of our biology that is non-biological and in the form of a stone tool. So we see what, what anthropologists and archaeologists have labeled as um, hand axes as a way of breaking open marrow using a sharp, blunt stone. Um, and so instead of evolving biologically, we evolved technologically. So with those technological adaptations came all kinds of diversity within those categories. One of the biggest ones we don't talk about is called perishable material culture. We talk about it, but not as much as non-perishable material culture. And one of the most obvious reasons of that is that perishable material culture decomposes, it perishes. Um, and so bone tools are one of those kinds of perishable material culture. Stone tools are not. Stone tools, obviously, they don't perish over time. Obviously, they're going to get um, sandblasted and turned over and break apart and things like that. But they'll last a heck of a lot longer than bones, which tend to be, you know, uh, eaten by other animals or break down much, much faster. So in regard to uh, thinking about words and concepts like the Stone Age, for example, the Stone Age is a mythic, uh, is essentially a, a mythology created by a culture that has perceived um, evolutionary progress in a linear fashion. Um, evolution doesn't mean simple to complex. Evolution just means change. And we see that both biologically and culturally. There have been, for example, people who used fire in prehistory and then gave up fire and stopped using it. Uh, we tend to think of things progressing in a way like Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, technological, whatever, Computer Age, iPhone Age. Uh, but those are really uh, anthropocentric terms coming from a culture that has created that concept of linear progress and then projects it onto the rest of humanity. For example, if we were to look at things in ages in that way, we would think of the Bushmen as potentially still in the Stone Age, even though they um, have, you know, used a lot of contemporary technology, they're not creating industry to do that. And they are equally as important and an aspect of humanity as other cultures that have invented those things. So it's not, uh, you know, the idea of evolutionary progress or cultural progress is a mythology created by an anthropocentric culture probably for, you know, the, the means of colonization and to steal land from other people. But that's, you know, that's another story. We can get into that later. Um, so just in terms of perishable material culture, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, there's rope and string. There's animal hides and furs, uh, bones, basket making, you know, sticks, all those things that we think of that are going to decompose quickly. That's perishable material culture. So if we were really going to, you know, look into, into prehistory, we wouldn't really necessarily think of things as a stone age. 
but rather um, just you know progressions of different technologies in use at different times. There's no way to know if there was a bone age, for example, because all of those things have been decomposed long before that. Um, the oldest bone tool that I'm aware of is a 400,000 year old cave lion femur. So, you know, big fat leg bone. And that was potentially used as a digging tool. It has marks on it that looks like people may have used it for digging. It's hard to tell with things in prehistory, uh, you know, what they were actually used for without the entire cultural context that surrounded them. So oftentimes we will, uh, you know, try to hypothesize as much as possible with as much of those contexts as we can. But in the end, it's still just a guessing game because we didn't actually see the people using them. Um, one of the challenging things with that is oftentimes if people can't come up with a reason, um, they'll end up just as ascribing it to what they call ritual, which is highly problematic for a lot of reasons. If you can't explain something, it doesn't mean that it was necessarily used uh, for a ritual purpose. It just means that you don't understand the cultural context. Could have been ritual, but it could have been a lot of other things too. Um, it's just one of those cliche things you see a lot in archaeology or paleoanthropology is people often passing off um, unexplainable archaeology as uh, ritual, or even sometimes on, on the extreme, like conspiracy theorists, and you'll have people say aliens or something like that, you know, like um, fake history channel shows. Um, so with that said, let's see, there's another, you know, um, in terms of technology and what we see them used for, um, there was a, a cave in South Africa where they found a bundle of uh, very sharp, thin bones bundled together, what we would call awls. Uh, and when you see something like that bundled together and cached away in a cave, what that generally implies is that somebody's mass producing those to trade them out. So you see uh, economics in play there. And that was 70,000 years ago in South Africa. Now you don't see those tools show up again for quite a while. Again, not necessarily that they weren't in use, but that they were decomposing. It's hard to find these things because they decompose. So we can only really find them in places like caves or deep underground or bogs, places that tend to preserve organic material for longer than other places, up in the ice. Um, so it's a challenge to kind of understand all of the stuff in regard to perishable material culture to try to actually understand when in time people started using these tools, which for me is part of the mystery and fascinating aspect of perishable material culture, or just material culture in general in prehistory is trying to understand when and why and how people developed these things. I used to think that, you know, everything was sort of created through an environmental impact, you know, or, or fluctuations in environmental needs. Um, however, you know, looking at certain aspects of technology, we can see that they weren't necessarily invented out of uh, a need, but an idea in order to unlock other aspects of food production um, or to get other important resources to use. And, you know, humans are unique. We have these opposable thumbs that allow us to craft all these kinds of things that a lot of other animals don't have. And so I think, you know, part of the diversity of our technology is specifically because of our hands. There's all kinds of other things, you know, people like to pinpoint, oh, it was the brain size, or it was the hands, or it was the use of fire. You know, they want to have one thing that um, sort of catalyzed humans into creating technology, but really, um, in a sense, you have to look at the complexity of the picture and understand that there's a, a sort of a perfect storm of things that, that all came together and influenced each other in multiple ways, and there's no one thing that really, you know, catalyzed humanity to start making things like this. Uh, so, yeah, in terms of bone tool usage, throughout prehistory, we've seen bones used for lots of different um, in survival skills, in the survival skills world, there's this aspect of um, organizing your needs based on necessity or, you know, organizing the things that you need based on how much you need them at that given time. So the, there's a term, you know, the sacred order of survival, uh, shelter, water, fire, and food. And the reason why that is in that order is because without, you know, if you want, you could add air to the first part because without three minutes of air, you die. Uh, you can die of exposure in three hours. You can die in three days without water, and you can die in three weeks without food. So, you know, obviously there's an accordion effect there, depending on your circumstances. That's just the general rule of thumb to keep in mind those things. Um, but speaking in, in terms of um, 
prehistory and those needs, we can see that actually bones were used to construct shelter. Uh, it's hypothesized that Neanderthals in Europe were using mammoth bones to construct uh, huge dome-like shelters that they would then, you know, probably put hides over. The hides have been long decomposed, but they found these structures and reconstructed them uh, and found out that, yeah, or, or theorized at least, you know, again, hard to tell, but uh, most likely, you know, there's a hearth in the middle and the way that it's set up, you can tell and you can try to reconstruct those things. Um, so cool to think about like uh, bone tools in prehistory being used to create buildings uh, to dwell in. That's also something that's been done in more contemporary times um, in Europe. I forget which town it is, but there's an actual church that is uh, built mostly by the bones. It's built in a cemetery and when they had to remove the cemetery for whatever reason, uh, they ended up constructing this entire church out of human bones. Super fascinating and interesting. Um, so let's see, shelter, water, fire. Um, with fire, they have also found that in the tundra during the ice age, it was hard to find materials to burn to cook our food on and to stay warm. And bones are actually flammable because of the carbon in the bone and also the fat content um, that's leached into the bone as well as some of that marrow. And fat burns like a candle, essentially. So if you think about it, you know, you could just throw bones in a fire and get them going, and those bones are going to burn quite a bit. So in terms of also thinking about ways of humans leveraging all the things that they were, all the resources that they were had in abundance, such as lots of excess giant bones from the megafauna they were consuming, uh, that also then became a fire source. Uh, and so food. Obviously bones, you can eat bones. Bone broth is super popular now in like the paleo circles. Um, but also, you know, there, there's different cultures that grind up bones and have like a, a, a slurry, like a milkshake type thing, and we'll drink that. Um, you know, obviously it's super high in all of the minerals and nutrients that you need in order to make your own bones, um, as well as like collagen and um, gelatin and all the things you need to make skin as well, fingernails, all those kinds of things, um, teeth. So bone tools in the uh, bone, bone tools bone food in the diet has been super important also throughout time, uh, and then getting down into the nitty gritty here of to, well so before that actually medicine uh, bone tools have been used in medicine for a long time too acupuncture needles were originally made out of bone tools very very long bone needles that they would stick down inside people very deeply like down through the sternum and things like that uh, before. Uh, steel and the standardization of acupuncture in China, lots of traditional people were using bone needles. Uh, super cool. So also think about like cultural aspects like ritual um, and dice for gambling, uh, skulls, you know, used as a, as a cup, for example. The back of the skull was used by some people as a, as a cup. That's where the word skull comes from. It's actually uh, Scandinavian, I forget which language, but it means toast, you know, to toast somebody, you say skull, and that's where the, the word for the skull comes from, supposedly. Uh, so, yeah, bones have a lot of practical and interesting usage over time and history. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, their usage in terms of what they're best used for. So stone, obviously, is one of the hardest things. You can break things open with it. Um, you can also, if it's a, a hard stone, but also high on the Mohs scale or whatever, you know, it's going to hold an edge. And so things like obsidian, which is essentially volcanic glass, while that's a rock, it's actually very brittle, even though it's super sharp. Um, so you can get really fine razor edge with flint and obsidian and things like that. And then more blunt objects as well. So stones are great for like slicing and hammering, whereas bones are unique to poking and scraping. You can use stones to scrape as well, um, but the way that you can work bone is very different and, and it's very easy in compared to stone. Whereas with stone, you have to do what's called flint mapping, where you're hitting stone against another stone, direct pressure or indirect pressure, um, or pressure even, just pressure flaking. But uh, with bones, all you really have to do is just grind them down on a another stone, a sandstone, or even just a pile of sand on a flat rock of any kind, and you end up just taking a lot longer, but it's really easy. It doesn't take any skill, really, whatsoever, other than just working the bone and understanding the shape that you want to get out of it. 
Um, and then what you end up happening, getting is a very sharp, pointy object. And until steel was invented, there really wasn't anything in nature that could do this as well as bone. That's why they were using uh, bone for acupuncture needles. Needles, you know, you can't really get uh, something this hard and this sharp and this pointy with a stone or with wood. So really, shell, antler, and bone are your best options for those things. Uh, and so, yeah, when we look at the record, archaeological record, and even in contemporary societies where they're still using this technology, bones are the majority of scrapey and pokey, is what I call it. So you've got your pokey tool, your awl. Um, and awl is basically, you know, the way I stitched this jacket together was by poking holes, first with an awl, and then threading the cord through, instead of a needle that has the hoop through the end of it because you can't really, because bone is so thick, it's harder to get those tiny needles the way you can with steel. Uh, and so that type of technology, again, didn't really exist until steel technology, the ability to forge those little teeny needles. Uh, and so back then you had much bigger thread and different ways of trying to get the thread through. So with animal skin, it's very easy to make a sharp thing like this and poke it through. Now with the scrapey side of things, what you have is something like this, which is, uh, and I'll do a close-up of these different tools um, to kind of insert in here. But what you have here is essentially like a draw knife. This is the metacarpal of an elk, or possibly a very large male deer. Um, and a metacarpal is this bone in our hand right here. Humans have five, one for each finger. And in an elk, it's actually part of their leg. So the way, you know, in a deer, it looks very different, um, and it's very long. Imagine this bone here being this long on an ungulate, you know, a deer or an elk. But it's really great because it's flat, and it's fused. Two of them are fused together. So you can see kind of the end of it in this one here. This is also a metacarpal. And it's two bones. The toes come out here, and they're fused together all the way down. So you can split it in half and get two relatively nice flat sides. And then once you rub them down on a, a stone and sand them, you can kind of get a really nice edge. So I've actually got three edges. This is a really great draw knife or fleshing knife for scraping hides. But I use this when I'm scraping animal skin. And I've got three edges. I've got a fine edge here, a more blunt edge here, and then a real good one here. So I can do this way. If I want to switch it up, I can go this way. And then if I really want to get in there, I can use this end here and scrape it this way. So then there's also lots of miscellaneous tools, right? Um, you've got something like a bone comb. Uh, you know, you, again, something you, you could also make this out of wood or stone, but just the ability to make it out of bone and then keep it, it's harder than wood. Um, it's not necessarily easier to work than wood, but it's probably going to last longer and be a little bit stronger. Um, and then this is a really cool tool. Here in the Northwest, a lot of the native cultures used beaver teeth as a sort of chisel. Because if you think about it, what do, beaver, what do beavers use their teeth for? They use them to cut wood. So beaver teeth are actually really strong and designed to do that. So what they would do is take, and still today, um, if they want to work on things in their traditional way, I've seen people use metal, I've seen people use these. There's a really great example of... Uh, a plank house design in Ridgefield, Washington, just north of Portland, the Castle Potal Plank House. And the main center beams in the plank house have this really beautiful texture design where they took beaver teeth and textured the entire thing. And that was a traditional thing that folks did uh, before the introduction of steel and still do today, obviously, um, for you know cultural reasons. So really what you do is you just take a beaver tooth and you haft it onto the end of a handle like this, and then you can use it to scrape and, um, you know, carve into wood. Uh, let's see, what other miscellaneous tools? Oh, this is a weird one. So here I've got a belt buckle that I made um, out of a buffalo shoulder blade. This was nothing I'd ever seen in the record before. Again, I was just kind of trying to figure out what I should do um, to make a belt buckle. And I thought, well, I could make one out of bone. I saw the shoulder blade, I saw the shape, I thought if I cut it out, and it works perfectly. It's awesome. It's interesting to think about things like this, and the utility and ingenious 
of humans in prehistory and how much stuff like this could exist or could have been created on the fly that we'll never know because it decomposed. Um, you know, something like this was never established because we don't see it, or maybe it was, but we just don't have a record of it. Generally, the things we see are the things that are going to be used most often across the globe, right? One of the more common tools you find that's a pokey tool is uh, the ulna awl. So it's um, an awl made out of the ulna, which is uh, basically the elbow of a deer. And you can kind of see here, it's actually, this is a full, uh, the ulna is this top bone, and it's fused together underneath with the radius. So it would basically be a, a, an elbow on a deer, like so. Um, and, and what you do is you just separate the ulna from the radius, and then you carve it down into a point. Now it's cool because it has this beautiful socket here where it connects to the other bone, and it fits the finger perfectly. A little power glitch, ready to go. So a couple of other interesting miscellaneous tools. Here we go. Here's a uh, astragalus bone. This is uh, basically like an ankle bone in a cow or a deer. This one is actually from a grass-fed free-range cow. Um, I got it at a paleo restaurant here in Portland where they make bone broth and they throw them out after they are finished with them. They're not quite decomposed enough from the boiling to fall apart, but they're actually easier to work. Um, and so you get this awesome bone that actually fits right in the hand, and it's already got this little notch right inside here. So see where it's all burned out? That actually is an impression. So you can fit perfectly something like a bow drill spindle right in there without having to modify the tool at all. Um, that's a really cool one. I use this all the time. That's why it's actually got that burned out spot in there. So another one is uh, fish hooks. So you've got this hook here, and this is uh, carved from a bone. This cable here, the line, the fishing line is actually stinging nettle uh, fiber. But you've got this little teeny bone hook there, and it's not barbed the way that our metal ones are, but it's catchy and sticky enough, um, just the grip of it, the angle of it. So if it gets a little tug, you then can jerk it out of the water. Um, I've tried fishing with it unsuccessfully, but I know people, uh, one of my, person who taught me how to do this, Lynx, she does this on a lot of her um, projects. There's another hook in here that is actually uh, from around here, traditionally. This is a, it looks like it might be a fish hook, but it's actually a bird hook. So this end would be tied to a longer cord that was actually tied to like a tree or a big stone. And then a bird would swallow this and it would get stuck in its throat and not be able to get away. And that was a way of trapping and killing the animal. Um, brings up a lot of interesting ideas around ethics in terms of hunting that we have today that aren't necessarily uh, matched up with a lot of the ways that people in prehistory and around the world have been able to acquire animal proteins through different methods that we may or may not think of as humane today, but obviously different societies have different ideas around those concepts. Um, it's an interesting thing to think about when you're looking at technology like this. It's not as necessarily easy to um, kill somebody as quickly as possible when you're using technology like this. Um, so an interesting kind of moral quandary in regard to some of these things. And maybe it wasn't for them, obviously, but maybe it was. Maybe they had ritualistic ways of processing um, that act, you know, on, on our own psyche. So another thing here, too, are arrowheads, actually. So I've got four arrowheads down here. And one of the things that's interesting about arrowheads is that we generally think of them as stones because we find them in a lot of places. But the availability and ease of craft with bone is so much more prevalent that it's theorized that actually most arrowheads were made out of bone and not stone. Um, oftentimes they'll find intact stone blade points in the skeletons of animals. And really, if those stone points had been used to stab the animal, they would have broken because a lot of things like obsidian, for example, break on impact. They're brittle. Um, and so the idea of bone as something that's actually also reusable potentially, and that stone, again, when we don't have an explanation, we can go to ritual, but perhaps a lot of those stones are given um, in honor to the animal's life. 
as a form of ritual offering. So we don't know the answer to that. And a lot of cultures do that kind of thing around the world. So it's possible that that's what was going on too. Um, and still goes on in some places. So it's hard to know though when there's no cultural continuity as in a place like Europe with um, a living indigenous population. In a lot of other places, all you have to do is ask the indigenous people <laughs> and they'll tell you. Unless it's uh, something that's so far away that's now no longer an aspect of their society, but it's still a uh, continuity of their people, and so it is their cultural items, right? Uh, we can get into some of that, um, you know, political stuff here. A lot of people like to say that, you know, oh, we want to have science that be apolitical and things like that. But when society itself is not apolitical, everything is permeated with politics in some way or other, some way or other. And if you're not going to mention the politics involved in this, then you're taking the stance of probably an oppressive group, you know, in regards to museum things and uh, museums basically hoarding indigenous people's cultural artifacts and, and um, objects, which a lot of them consider to be alive, you know, and living. So it's one of the reasons why I like to make these things and, and become an educator is to follow a lot of a better standard of ethics around these things. But also, oftentimes when you go to see objects like these, they're behind glass in a museum. Um, and, you know, it's such a different experience to be able to pick this up and hold it in your hand and understand and puncture a piece of leather with it and, and really connect with that aspect of our humanity that's about making things from our natural environment with our own hands. And then being able to feel that lineage of, archaeology, you know, that lineage of ancestral technology all throughout archaeology into our past for millions of years. Um, but, you know, I made this, and it has a deep personal significance to me, but uh, it's not the same kind of significance that it would be for indigenous people in any particular area, right? Um, and if somebody were to steal this from me and then put it on display and charge people money, I would get upset. Or if this was my grandfather's. Or if it was, a, you know, fact in my own cultural history, it would be upsetting. Um, so, you know, while a lot of this stuff isn't cultural appropriation, because the further back in prehistory I've researched, the more commonality is I've found. Like, the, again, this, this all, you can find on pretty much every continent except Antarctica, of course, uh, because humans, wherever deer populations existed, made this tool. Um, and... So, you know, in terms of cultural appropriation, if you go back far enough, there's a, a shared ancestral culture of, you know, hunter-gatherers that goes back a million years, all the way to before we left Africa. Uh, but that doesn't excuse the colonial aspects or settler, colonial, settler colonialism or privilege that exists today, right? Uh, and so, you know, Appropriation isn't necessarily an aspect of this. It is. But if you know what you're doing, you've done the research, it's not appropriation. What you end up getting into is the political conflict of settler colonialism, uh, which applies to things like museums and the archaeological and anthropological fields. So I have to address those things because if you don't, um, then again, you're, you are being political, even if you say you're not. So... Uh, and that, to me, you know, one of the reasons I love learning this stuff is because it allows me to kind of connect with other cultures. And I'm just fascinated by all humans. And I love um, understanding what brings us all together and what connects us. And in order to understand that, you also have to understand what disconnects us. Um, and that's an aspect of this research, too. Should be. So anyway, getting off my high horse rant there. Um, this is a really cool knife made by uh, Leland Gilson, state archaeologist in Oregon for 25 years, former state archaeologist, Dr. Leland Gilson. He gave this to me at Echoes and Time last year for my bone tools display. Um, here's an antler tine. Antler tines are great for pressure flaking, so again, working with stone. Here's another interesting thing I want to throw out here, is if you have to have a pressure flaking tool like a antler or a bone in order to fine tune a stone tool, is it a stone tool or is it a bone tool or is it a combination? If you can't make the tool without this other one, it doesn't live in a vacuum by itself. 
So it requires this complexity. Again, like when I was talking about um, origins of, you know, all of the technology and the complexities that are involved in that, you know, brain, intelligence, hand working, different things that all came together, coalesced into this thing. The same is true of the actual pieces of technology. So, you know, a stone tool doesn't exist in a vacuum by itself. It is also all of these other things. Another example would be a handle. So here's a bone knife that I used a stone to grind into a blade. So there's two elements coming together there, right? And then I've hafted it onto wood. There's a third element to hold it so that I can easier, it's easier to use in my hand. Another element that's in here is pine pitch and charcoal. So I've mixed pine pitch and charcoal together to create a glue that is now part of how the binding there it binds the blade to the handle. This is used, uh, it's a very dull blade. It's used for removing animal skins, so I don't accidentally cut the hide when I'm removing the skin. That's why it's dull. Uh, so bone tools are great. Another thing, it's a, basically a scraping tool. Cutting isn't really something bones do very well, uh, unless they're a, uh, when you fracture them and they first break, that edge is pretty sharp. So you have to be careful like when you're working bones and stuff. Um, also bone dust, you don't want to breathe it in. I'll get into that in a second, but... Um, so cool. Yeah, here's another, here's a handle that I made out of bone. So here, here's a bone blade with a wood handle and a bone handle on a drum beater. So this is a, you know, you can see there, there's lots of different applications for bone that aren't just the pokey or scrapey things. Um, when you're straightening arrow shafts, you need a lever to kind of compress it. Deer vertebrae have this, uh, hole right through the middle of it and a great little hand lever here. So you can really get in there again. It's a tool you don't even have to modify. It works great for straightening arrow shafts. Um, interesting other bones on here. I think one of the last ones I'll talk about is the, um, the penis bone, which this one is from a raccoon. Some mammals have actual bones in their penises. Um, and you see these used all the time for all kinds of things. People use them as jewelry. They'll make a little sharp awl out of it. I've seen them, people put it through their nose. I've seen um, Gooday from Echoes. He actually made a toothpick out of one, sort of as a joke. But it's a perfect you know, shape and size for that. So um, again, versatility of bone tools, super important. And uh, one of my favorite things to talk about. Now let's talk a little bit about what makes a good bone tool. So, you know, again, it depends on what you're trying to make, right? So if you're making miscellaneous things, it's kind of the sky's the limit with your imagination what's going to make a good tool. You know, like I made a bone belt buckle out of a scapula, just kind of brainstorming it, um, you know, based on the shape, you know. So I saw the bones, and what can I make out of this? I made that. Uh, same thing, you know, here's the astragalus uh, handhold for a bow drill, you know. Again, totally random. So it's kind of like, look at bones. What are your needs? What are the shapes? And what's the strength of the actual bone? And you can apply all that sort of complexity to creating something. Now, for your classic uh, pokey and scrapey tools, what you're really looking for is those flat bones that are easier to work. Um, you know, the, the metacarpal and the awl, or the, <laughs> the metacarpal and the ulna are basically, you know, in a deer, going to get you pretty far um, with your needs in terms of bone tools for pokey and scrapey. Uh, so, again, you've got, you know, long, flat bone here that you can make. You know, this could have made a whole bunch of arrowheads just by... Um, separating this into sections and then carving each one down, sanding it on a stone. So really in selecting, it just has to do with like what you're trying to make, what you want to get out of it, um, and go from there, you know. Um, finding bones, you know, oftentimes I'll just be walking through the woods and I find them on the ground, or they find me, I don't know. And uh, it's great when that happens because usually they're already cleaned by insects, beetles, and things like that. Um, they might be a little dirty. They might be too old and decayed and cracking already, but ideally you could get bones as fresh as possible so that you can kind of cure them yourself. Um, one of the best ways of doing that is going to a butcher shop or, you know, being a hunter yourself and acquiring them or having friends who will give you the bones. But short of that, I live in an urban context, so it's hard for me to get out hunting, to get out and, you know, be in an environment where that's happening all the time. But there is a butcher shop in town that processes game animals during hunting season. So if I want deer or elk bones, and generally speaking, like at, at game processing places, they'll just cut the, the leg here and throw it in the dumpster. So I'll go there and knock on the door. Hey, I'm 
you know, Rewild Portland, we're a nonprofit. We do ancestral technology. Could we use some of these bones? They're like, yeah, you can go dig through our dumpster. Uh, and the cool thing about that, too, is they'll usually just keep everything on there. So you might get a little bit of meat. You might get a little bit of hide and then the sinew and the bones. So you get all kinds of stuff. This this part of the deer is just one of the most useful um, pieces of, a, of nature to, in terms of human interaction, interactive views. Um, so finding bones, you know, there's lots of different things. Roadkill is another great uh, opportunity, and now it's legal in Oregon to pick up roadkill. You still have to uh, file with the state after you pick it up the day after, but uh, and that's just with deer. There's other regulations for other animals, but generally speaking, you know, you can pick up roadkill and utilize that as well. Um, if you do do those things, hunter shops, you know, roadkill, then you're going to have to process and clean the bones yourself, which there's lots of different ways of doing that. Um, I like to actually, I just have a wire mesh cage and I stuff the bones inside there and wire it to a tree and cover it in duff or leaves. What that does is uh, it attracts natural beetles that like to eat those things, but it minimizes the flies. So we don't end up having, you know, uh, a lot of maggots come and excrete that chemical that smells like rotting flesh. Um, instead, what you get is it, it dries out and then beetles come in and they'll eat it off. Um, as long as it's dark, beetles like it where it's dark. So I wire mesh big enough holes for beetles to get through, not big enough for mice to get through um, or shrews or little things. They like to chew on bones to get some calcium, you know. Um, so hide that under the leaf litter. And then I wire it to a tree so it can't get dragged away by like a coyote or something like that. Uh, and then dark. So, but also before that, you want to get as much of that meat and sinew and everything off the bones. You want them as clean as possible before that process. Um, you can also try maceration, which is, you know, soaking them in water and the bacteria will eat most of it. I don't do that method because it's just so stinky and I don't have the patience and uh, frequency of checking a thing um, regularly enough so that it doesn't go completely rancid and disgusting. Um, hazards with working with bone, you want to wear a bandana um, and potentially you could soak the bones for a couple of weeks. That tends to make them actually pliable and, and carvable. Um, you know, working them green is great. If you're working dry bones, you're going to get bone dust and all those little bone fragments are, can make you really sick and actually will just like cut up the interior of your lung. So wear a bandana or a face mask. Obviously, all of us, because of COVID, now just kind of have those. So um, just make sure you can't breathe in the dome dust. If you can smell it, you're breathing it in. Um, and then, yeah, just watch out for those sharp edges. So, so yeah, the last couple things I want to talk about is just when you're working on these, you can see that it's actually really simple and easy to make these things. Now, the complexity comes in understanding how they're going to be used and the, and the aspects of how to make them in the complex environment in which one lives or in which this technology emerged. Uh, oftentimes we think of, you know, modern technology as being more sophisticated or things like that. But the reality is just there's a whole industrial economy that just made these things faster. It made it easier to make these in terms of time, not in the whole complexity of like the oil economy that has caused climate change, for example, in order to do something like this technology could do in a fraction of the time. An example, you know, is that this here, this bone, uh, it took me 10 hours to score it with a rock back and forth, 10 hours, five hours on this side, five hours on this side. There were ways I could have done it faster, but you know, I wanted to play around with experimenting with different methods. Um, I was able to 10 hours crack this open and then hours more, a few more hours of sanding it down to get the tool that I wanted. Now I tried it again with another tool and instead of 10 hours, it took me 10 seconds in a bandsaw. So when you think about the time intensity, the technology is very simple. It's just time consuming, right? Um, and when we think of industrial technology as being more sophisticated in ways, it, it, oftentimes it's really not. You know, a hammer is just a steel rock at the, at the end of a stick. You know, um, those kinds of technologies we've had for so long. Um, and now we just create them in different ways that end up you know, causing climate change or whatever, you know, there's lots of, anyway, that's a whole, you know, it's hard for me to not get my, on my high horse. So I'm trying really hard here. Um, keep it to bone tools. Last thing I want to talk about uh, in regard to the complexities of these is thinking about that time consumption. Um, and the time consumption for me makes me think about the sort of old idea of hunter gatherer people or our, you know, human ancestors having lives that are quote unquote, nasty, brutish, and short. 
um, and you know, spent in constant state of hunger in search of food, right? Uh, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, Marshall Salins wrote a book called Stone Age Economics, highly recommend it, in which he studied immediate return hunter-gatherers and realized that uh, you know, contemporary immediate return hunter-gatherers living in very harsh environments, and in their environments, even though they were harsh, they only had to work two to three hours a day to get the food that they needed to subsist, whereas neighboring agricultural societies and agricultural societies around the world have to work eight to 12 hours to acquire the same amount of food. Now, um, you know, there's a couple of different things in there in terms of leisure time. You think about the time it takes to make these kind of tools and the amount of leisure time that immediate return hunter-gatherers have it makes sense that there was time to hang out and make these kinds of things. And then also the reusability of like bone arrowheads, for example. You know, it's not like they're having to make these things all the time. Um, and, you know, they're lightweight and their possessions are few, so they could take them with them and, and be migratory and not have to worry about um, the weight of carrying these things, which is one of the reasons why they were more nomadic um, and migrational than they were sedentary, right? Um, but in terms of how, you know, that, that idea of work and leisure, I think about that a lot when I'm working on these tools uh, and how long it takes me and also the ability to kind of create art and be more artistic about what I'm doing when I'm doing this. Uh, and so I just, I like to put that out there to people because it's a common myth that our ancestors in prehistory, um, yeah, spent, spent all their time searching and, and for food, you know, hungry. But the reality is that they didn't. The majority of their time was spent in leisure. And we see that today with contemporary immediate return hunter-gatherers. Even in the harshest kinds of environments, imagine that type of um, way of life in a more um, abundant place that are now you know, dominated by pastoralists and agriculturalists. And you can imagine you know, how much more leisure there might even been in those places. We don't know exactly. But uh, it's one of those myths I like to dispel when I'm talking about prehistory because it's super prevalent. And um, you know, the idea that somehow when we built civilization, we were, you know, rising out of this horrible way of life uh, is simply untrue. And, um, you know, it's one of those things that I love to explore when I'm working with ancestral technology and explain to people. Uh, this gets in, in line with the idea of survival skills. You know, oftentimes we use that word survival to talk about hunter-gatherers, like they were in a constant state of survival, um, which isn't true. When you have a culture that's intact, that's in a place for thousands of years, they know where all the water is, they know where all their food is, and they know how to be there without having to starve all the time, right? S survival is a specific situation where you're removed from what you know. You're removed from culture. You're removed from a land that is familiar to you. And then you don't know where your water is going to go or come from. You know, you've got to purify. They're just different things. You don't know where the shelter is. You don't know how the, where the fire is. You've been removed from a context of cultural, uh, you know, routine and ritual and knowledge of place. And so even then, you know, indigenous people and hunter-gatherers were never living in a constant state of survival ever, even today where they still exist, uh, because they have those deep ancestral ties and knowledge and sense of place. So anyway, that's my bone tool spiel, you know, with some other interesting anthropological stuff thrown in there. Uh, you never know what, what I'm going to end up <laughs> throwing in in this talk. Uh, but the threads are all so deeply connected to me that I can't talk about one thing without talking about all the other aspects. And so I appreciate you spending the time to listen to me rant about bone tools and all these other aspects of rewilding, what I call rewilding. Um, so thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, I hope you check out the rest of Country Fair. Check out Rewild Portland. Echoes in Time is coming up. Uh, it's the last week of July or you know, second to last week of July, 19th to the 24th. Classes just like this all week long on our Facebook event, and we'll just be posting them live on Facebook. So uh, check those out if you get an opportunity. Otherwise, we'll probably be archiving them like this. You might be watching this, and it's already you know a year, five, ten years from now. Uh, but we'll see. Hopefully, you'll connect with us and uh, learn a lot more about all this kind of all this kind of stuff. Thanks.